And now stackers who pay off your credit cards in full, a message from Discover about rewards. If you're a loyal credit card customer, you should be rewarded for your loyalty, preferably with something that's useful, like cashback match, for instance. Discover matches all the cashback you've earned at the end of your first year. Finally, rewards that make sense. Discover, exceptionally common sense. Learn more at discover.com slash match. Limitations apply. Happy New Year, OG. It's 2022. Do you say Happy New Year or Happy New Year's? Well, it's singular, right? Isn't this a new year? If it was New Year's. I would think so. But everybody does say Happy New Year's. And it's how, stop that, people. If you could stop that and stop driving slow in the left-hand lane down the highway, I would love you forever. <laughs> you know what else I love? I love the men and women protecting our country and uh, want to give them a big shout out this new year. New Year's. Oh, wait, New Year. Yes. Happy and healthy New See, Year. I'm going to get it all screwed up now. On behalf of the men and women here in the basement and the men and women at Navy Federal Credit Union, here's a shout out to our troops. Let's all have a year of stacking Benjamins together. Here's the song that we'd like to do for all the younger set of people, the teenagers and what have you. This one's called Vacation Zope. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and Happy New Year! Are you behind on changing everything about yourself for 2022? You know, your personality, your looks, and life circumstances? Well, we can't help you with that one annoying thing. You know the one. We can help you plan your financial goals. Here to help us kick off 2022 from I Will Teach You to Be Rich, we welcome our smartest guest so far this year, Ramit Sadi. Plus, where should you move for the best return on your retirement money? In our headline segment, we'll share one publication's list. We'll then throw out the Haven Lifeline to someone looking to find a local financial advisor. And in our TikTok Minute, we'll talk prenup. Information that would have been useful before that trip to Vegas in 97, am I right? And now, two guys who are resolved to help you stack more Benjamins this year. It's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. That's a New Year's resolution I can promise will not go away in the next two to three weeks. And there you can say New Year's because it's possessive. It is, yes. We're going to give all y'all a better New Year. There you go. Even better. All y'all blows my mind. Just... Hey, everybody. Welcome to 2022. Let me be the first to welcome you. I'm Joe Saul Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter and... One of two gentlemen that make this podcast roll into 2022. Of course, it wouldn't be the same without my buddy across the card table again, kicking it off. Gentlemen, you said. All right. Mr. OG is here. I'll take it. You have a good uh, new year at the OG household? Our new year's was awesome. Ours, ours is very, was very incredibly quiet. Incredibly quiet. We, uh, we generally have one... At most, one family come over. My rule is I don't go anywhere on New New Year's Eve. It's I stay New at home. Year's Eve because it is possessive. Yes, I believe so. It's terribly confusing. But yeah, we have a little, uh, you know, we have a little thing. Sometimes people come over, sometimes they don't, you know. Well, that was our plan. Our plan this year, obviously, with COVID raging, tour pushback because of that. And, and looking at a, a quiet couple of months, you know. We thought one family, and then the day before New Year's Eve, got the call. Member of our family tested positive. So, so they're not coming. Cool. So they're a severe. So they did not come. Oh, nobody came. Nope. It was it was just us. Boo. But enough about New Year's. We're gonna kick things off for your New Year because as Doug so eloquently said, OG, we've got the Ramit Sadie upstairs talking Woo-hoo. to mom right now. How about yeah, and that? If, if there's anybody who can help get your motor running, I think it's your meat. 
Uh, he's probably going to be able to do it. I'm pretty confident. He's okay with words. He's, he, I think, has the word thing down. Of course, if you're not familiar with Ramit, we're going to ask him, what's the right stuff to focus on? How do we get our act together and drive into this new year? Let's make 2022 the year that we build our stack. But we got a great headline and our TikTok minute. We are action packed today. So why don't we go ahead and get this party started? Oh, we will right after we. Hey, stacker who pays off your credit card in full. A message from Discover about rewards. If you're a loyal credit card customer, you should be rewarded for your loyalty, preferably with something that's useful, like cashback match, for instance. Discover matches all the cash back you've earned at the end of your first year. Finally, rewards that make sense. Discover, exceptionally common sense. Learn more at discover.com slash match. Limitations apply. Do you own or rent your home? Sure you do. And I bet it can be hard work. You know what's easy? Bundling policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowners or renters insurance along with your auto policy. And it's a good thing too because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to Geico.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's Geico easy. Visit Geico.com today. That's Geico.com. And now, let's get the party started. Hello, darlings. And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our headline here comes today from uh, Magnify Money. Of course, uh, Magnify Money, a sponsor of the show, but not why we like the blog. And I've explained this, I think before, but we asked Magnify Money to sponsor us a long time ago because we like what they do so much. And OG, oh, they are- Way before we were cool and way after they were cool. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny. They were tiny, we were tiny, but they were incredible then, still incredible now. Julie Ryan Evans wrote a piece outlining the study that they did on where you need more than a million dollars to retire in the United States. Besides the OG household. <laughs> That's more like six million. That's just what you charge people, the entry fee. It's like a club. To get into yeah, it's gonna be six million dollars. Oh, that's what it costs me to retire. No, that's what it costs you to retire at my house. So you're renting out the rooms. The Airbnb fee. She writes location, location, location. It's no surprise where you live would make a big difference in how much money you need to retire there. What is interesting slash frightening slash reassuring, pick your adjective, is just how big of a nest egg retirees need to retire in various locales. You know what was even more scary about this was, to use the financial geek phrase, the standard deviation on these OG, like the difference in these cities. You'll need more than a million dollars to retire with an average lifestyle in 28 of the 384 U.S. metros, a retiree in San Francisco oh boy. Ne- needs a nest egg on average of $1.564 million. That's the highest in okay. the U.S. Not a surprise. But doable. But also not a surprise that that would be number one. Yeah, I mean, I thought you were going to whip out like a $3 million number. If that one's the biggest, no, 1.5, I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's the realm of possibilities. And I know the 4% rule has changed, but that's not lifestyles of the rich and famous either. I mean, this no. is this is not a big uh, big lifestyle. That's about $60,000 a year plus whatever you get from Social Security on top of that. So maybe looking at 80, 85. Yeah, I mean, putting food on the table. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can make it work on 85,000. Uh, 14 of the 28 metros in which retirees need more than a million to retire are in which state? California, California. Yeah. If, and by the way, did you no, see it's California? <laughs> did you see the number? Is that your, is that your Arnold? Arnold? Yeah, of course. California also had the biggest number of exits this year, by the way, the biggest net migration out of the state. Yeah. They were net out. Uh, I think I saw Illinois was New York was number two. I know that California is number one, New York. But number I think two. New York is still like that ebb and flow between New York and Florida. Right. It's like a super highway. You get yeah. to a certain age and you're, you're in New York, you're contractually obligated to move to Florida. I think so. <laughs> you, like a fast you, pass at Disney. It totally is. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sir, you're 64. You're, you should be in Boca. <laughs> what are you doing? And listen to this. The least expensive metro of the 384 cities they looked at is a city that I drive through Often when I'm road tripping between Texarkana and relatives in 
the Midwest, Jackson, Tennessee. Okay. Jackson, Tennessee, you can make it work on $495,000. Cool town. Yeah. I'll tell you, every time I've stayed there and I've gone on, you know, runs in the morning before I got back on the road, there's plenty of uh, Civil War battlefields around there to explore. Lots of history. There is uh, the Casey Jones Museum is there. Uh, so if you're interested in railroads, uh, just some some fascinating stuff. A, a minor league baseball team in town with a nice nice little stadium, half a million dollars. Danville, Illinois, by the way, was second at five hundred and ten, and two Danville, Texas. Illinois, huh? Yeah. Okay, I know a Danville, Indiana. Cool town. This is across the border. It's like Texarkana, Arkansas. <laughs> I don't think so, but okay, no, probably not. And two Texas towns, McAllen and Brownsville. We're both at 500 and, and, and 13. McAllen. It's not McAllen. It's McAllen. It's McAllen. Like I'd like a McAllen with cheese, please. <laughs> no? Oh, boy. I heard those are delicious. When you look at these numbers, though, so I have these two competing thoughts. Number one, you haven't done a phenomenal job of saving. We now have technology that will allow you to hang out with people online you know, had, had we moved to Texas from Michigan instead of 12 years ago, 30 years ago, it would have been, OG like moving to the moon. We would have had to write letters to people, make long distance phone calls that cost you a bajillion dollars to talk to people. Now my daughter is in Japan. My son is in Seattle. We will have family chats on zoom where it looks like they're in the next room, you know, that they're upstairs talking to mom instead of halfway around that's, the world. That's how I communicate with my kids now. They are literally in the next room and we FaceTime them. Boys, it's dinner time. What? Okay, here you go. I'm playing video games. We are very quickly becoming Wally, aren't we? Where, where we can't even be bothered to get up. I'm like, oh, I could walk over there and tell them that it's dinner time. But instead... Oh, no, we yell. We yell. Oh, you do? Dinner. But they, you know, they get the headphones on with the surround sound and... Uh, William got a VR uh, goggles for Christmas this year, which let me tell you a little something. They are super cool if you're the person wearing them and you look like a total idiot if you're the person, <laughs> if you're watching somebody. Do it. <laughs> because in your mind, like what you see yes. is two lightsabers and you're listening to dance music and you're like chopping up blocks, like based on the beat of the music. It's like, boom, 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 boom. Boom, boom, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and everybody else just sees you flailing around <laughs> with this big contraption on your head. It's bizarre how how lifelike that stuff is. But to your point, we, we can be around family and be in some of these faraway places. Do you move to make it so that you can have a better standard of living? Do you move to a place like Danville or, or Jackson or uh, McAllen with cheese? I mean, I don't see why... If you're still not considering it, the lifestyle move, not not necessarily for the money component, although that's, you know, that's a part of it, but lifestyle in terms of like what you really want to do. I mean, what are we on year freaking three of COVID now? But if you haven't considered your lifestyle experience, money is component of that, how much money you make or how your lifestyle can be and that sort of thing. But all the other stuff that goes into your lifestyle decision weather. I mean, people ask us all the time, like, oh, so you guys been in Texas now eight years. Now, what made you move? And I'm like, the weather. <laughs> really? What? I'm like, no, it was snowing and we were tired of it. So we wanted to go to a place that had less likelihood of that. And so there's, there's that. There's the activities that you enjoy. Are you a beach person or are you a mountain person? Are you a hiking person? Are you a biking person? You know, those sorts of things. Um, schools for kids, if that's, you know, still in your life right now. Uh, being close to other family, you know, I mean, to your point, you can zoom everybody and that's super cool, but you know, there's something about being close to mom or dad, especially, you know, as years go on. So if you haven't thought about that yet, I think that this is a good example of there's a thousand places between where you are right now and, you know, the other side of the country that you could pick up and go to. And especially now with Jobs increasingly staying more remote. You know, I just don't see why it's not something a lot of people, more people are considering. This is something I'm really on the fence about 
Because when we moved back from Texas to Detroit, the one thing that I didn't realize because of all this technology, I thought it would be an easy move and I'd be able to still hang out with my Texarkana friends. And I'll tell you that Zoom is fine and text messaging is fine and uh, playing video games together over long distances is fine. But man, there's nothing like being in the same room or being, you know, around the same campfire or whatever it is. And for me, moving back to Texarkana, where our adopted, quote, family is, it's not where my family is that I grew up with, but the family that we kind of created, our friends here, was such a move. Was And it was important to move back that I feel like sometimes these location moves, you know, you move to Jackson, Tennessee, and maybe you maybe you'll make new friends there, OG, maybe you don't, but I feel like we kind of discount the people that are in our lives and the opportunities that I I think it's especially dangerous to move out of a place like, and you know, you talk about in San Francisco now, you, a lot of these people can work from anywhere, right. And the job's virtual, but there's also something to be said for showing up at the office where the boss is from time to time and going to lunch with your boss, because being in the same place and being in a place where they can see you and they network with you. Like I feel like that doesn't translate as well as it could to an online experience. Yeah. I mean, being in the proximity of, you know, they say the proximity of power, right? I mean, if you're trying to move up in your career, you better make sure that you're visible and visible may be in person, you know, going to lunch with the boss, but it could also be, you know, making sure that you're keeping your, superiors aware of what's going on you know it's like the it's like the phrase you know the tree falls in the wood does anybody hear it right if you do good work for your company and nobody knows you did it does it count (laughs) you know and the answer is probably not you know so regardless of whether or not you're closer if you're not close you know from a career standpoint i think you have to be cognizant of keeping an inventory of the good work that you do so you can you can use that yeah, I think there's there's more to it than just standard of living is really, it sounds like, where we both come down on this. And one thing I felt lucky to do <laughs> when we were when we were homeless uh, and living a more nomadic lifestyle was I got to play test it. And you and I have talked about this before. You know, if you like an area, maybe find a way to take a month off work and live there for a little bit longer than a week or two weeks. And try to get into the community a little bit, whatever, you know, organizations you plan on joining, go sit in on those things and see, see, you know, get it, get into the community a little bit. But I definitely learned that living in new places, while I enjoy visiting new places, living in new places for me wasn't the exciting thing I thought it was going to be. I actually hated it. Told you so. Yeah. I totally, totally wanted a home, but that's going to be different for everybody. So play test it. Yeah. Hey, time for our TikTok minute. This is the segment of the show where OG and I look at a TikTok influencer, which some of the phenomenal work they're doing. And sometimes I use the word phenomenal in air quotes. Sometimes it is phenomenal. This one was sent to us by our friend, Josh Overmeyer, uh, who said, hey, this might be a good TikTok minute. So thanks for this, Josh. But uh, OG, did Josh send us something air quotey? Or something legit. Definitely air quoting. No, not legit. Well, let's see. This uh, this actually is an Instagram reel. Same stuff, uh, different platform. Here we go. Married, I want to get a prenup. What? That doesn't even make sense. I make more money than you. That's not the point. The point is that a prenup is an important step toward protecting both of us and our finances later on in life. But don't you love me? This isn't very romantic. Of course, but if we can't talk about money now, how are we going to talk about all of the other tough topics like kids, parents, buying a home, later in our life together? I still don't see why we need to do this. It'll help outline how money and assets will be split amongst our kids and your kids from your past marriage, if either of us will be responsible for alimony in the chance we do get divorced, and we live in California, a community property state. So a prenup may help us avoid becoming responsible for each other's debts. This doesn't have to be some crazy one-sided thing. Many prenups indicate assets to be split 50-50 down the middle, but it's important to get it in writing to protect us both. Those are some good points, and I love you, so let's call our lawyer on Monday. You don't hear that often. Those are great points. I love you, so let's call our lawyer. Um, My favorite part in there was like, how are we going to discuss things like children? And what about, it's like, you should probably be discussing that now. 
if you're getting <laughs> you married. <laughs> Call me crazy, but you should probably have some conversations about what your family planning is going to look like. No stink on that one, though. He sent us a serious one. Yeah. What's up with that, Overmeyer? Yeah. yeah. But the prenup discussion, OG, oh, that is hard. That is a difficult, difficult discussion to have. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Was it wasn't a thing when I back when I got married? There was no such thing. Um, I, I didn't. It wasn't even something that I considered. I don't know. Did you guys consider it? No, but I think as people increasingly come to the table with more assets, yeah, because people are generally getting married at later stages in life, right? That that is something you really have to have to think about. And it doesn't have anything to do with, I love you less. It just has to do with, Hey, we, uh, well, she brought up something in there about like, you know, what happens to your kids and, and our kids and that sort of thing that certainly adds some complexity to it. And thinking about it on the other side of the equation, this is also true for estate planning. You know, when you're thinking about, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's easier if you're married and you've got three kids and that's all there is to it. You know, if you don't do an estate plan, the, the state that you live in has an estate plan for you, which is give all your crap to your wife or your husband. And if you guys both die, then it goes to your kids evenly. You know, I mean, like that's a generic way of doing it and, and kind of makes sense and resonates with most people. But as you start adding complexity in there, whether it's complexity in terms of a second marriage or a situation with one of your kids, you know, who is in trouble financially or has a spouse that you don't particularly care for, or, you know, like all these other layers of things that can happen as you uh, kind of go on with life. Now, now the easy plan doesn't work as well. And so you have to create your own and whether it's a prenup or an estate planning document, the hard part's the, the conversation, you know, it's not the execution super easy. You hit by yeah. a bus and you got to go to a straight, good, good estate plan. They pull the thing off the shelf. You call the attorney, they go, okay, da, 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 it's done. The hard part is figuring that stuff out in advance or talking about it with your prenup and or, and or with your estate plan. So, And I know that in, in a lot of places, OG, if you're in an LGBTQ relationship, it's even more complex, like the complexity on top of complexity because of the way that... Yeah, that- and every state's different in how they think about that. If your spouse isn't uh, a U.S. citizen, that has there's an issue there as it relates to uh, spousal giving and that sort of thing. Because then your kids are, but you're, you know, maybe, you know, if your kids are, are born in America, but your spouse isn't, I mean, it just, every, every ounce of extra stuff that you have going on in your life that isn't one spouse, two kids, white picket fence. <laughs> right. You know? and, you, and you both showed up broke. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? exactly. Yep. Yeah. Then, you well, know, if that, if that happened, you got high school sweethearts, 18 years old, you know, <laughs> you started you with nothing, nothing. But a bunch of debt together. Yeah. Yeah. That Okay. You're probably good. Coming up next, uh, Ramit Sadi is going to join us. He, of course, is the best-selling well, author. Pulled a good one right out the gate here. I know. How about that? What a way to rip the Band-Aid right off 2022. We're like, hey, we're going to take you seriously 2022. Ramit Sadi is the best-selling author behind I Will Teach You To Be Rich, one of the top personal finance books of all time. And also he has a new podcast out, but he's not here to talk about those things. He's going to tell you what we need to focus on in 2022. But to get to that, I think we got to talk a little bit about new year's resolutions and we got the man to do that. Doug, how were you kicking off the year? Stackers, I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. You know, before we hear from Ramit about a better you in 22, hey, that rhymes, uh, trademark, copyright, let's ask a quick question about your resolutions. You know, New Year's resolutions actually started 4,000 years ago as the Babylonians promised their gods they would pay their debts at the beginning of each year, probably promising some Sally Mae rep that the check was in the mail. But the Romans also made promises to their gods on New Year's, a tradition that I diligently followed last weekend by praying to the porcelain god I'll never drink that much cheap champagne again. Not just in 2022, but like ever. Every year, because people swear this is the year they'll change, my question for you is this. What is the most common resolution people plan for the new year? I'll be back with your answer right after I get Ramit Sadie's microphone and a hot latte ready. I 
I actually had a pretty good holiday this year, OG. I did not uh, overspend, which is cool. How about you? Nice. Uh, I didn't did not not overspend. <laughs> Well, guess what? Navy Federal can help you take control of your finances after the holidays, OG. You can get a low intro APR on their platinum credit card. And that is not a great idea unless you are consolidating debt or number two, you pay down your debts in full and you're looking at a better reward program because you can get a low intro APR on that card. It's their lowest rate card. And it's a great tool to consolidate your debt. Navy Federal even has multiple savings and investing options to help you get closer to your financial goals. They offer digital tools and educational resources to help guide your decisions. With Navy Federal, you can automate your savings and investing and put your money to work for you even as you sleep. And nothing OG likes better than sleeping. Than sleep, yes. You're not counting sheep, you're counting Benjamins as you fall asleep. Plus, you can buy fractional shares. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. That's NavyFederal.org. Uh, message and data rates may apply. Savings products insured by NCUA. Investment options are available through Navy Federal Investment Services and are not insured by NCUA. And now a message from Discover about customer service and common sense. When you have credit card questions, it's nice to have them answered by a real person. You know, someone who can actually understand your issues and work to resolve them. In other words, what you don't need is a robot. And that's why Discover offers helpful U.S.-based representatives available 24-7. No wonder we call it live customer service. Discover, exceptionally common sense. Hey there, stackers. I'm future six-pack owner and cheap champagne connoisseur, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And we all wish we could change something about ourselves. And of all the ways in which we might change, what's the top resolution people make? Coming in second is the promise to read more, probably because they know Joe's book is finally here. Then in third, it's to learn something new. And coming in fourth is one of our favorites, to save more money. But the answer to our question and the number one thing people swear they'll change about themselves with a New Year's resolution is they want to change the way they eat and how much exercise they'll get. Joe's mom is passive-aggressively congratulating you that your retirement means less to you than your buns of steel, but I'll be more on point. Let's get saving more money in 2022, peeps. And I'm not just here talking a good game. Let's bring in someone I call the closer to convince you, Ramit Sadie. And here he comes kicking off the year with us. He looks awfully fresh for a guy that just got done with, I'm sure, a bunch of a bunch of New Year's parties. Ramit Sadie's here. How are you, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. And I hope like hell it's a better 2022 than 2020. 2021, the first half kind of felt like a continuation or me to the dumpster fire we had in 2020. Yeah, it can only go up from here. So let's all hope for that. Well, the good news is you're going to help us with that. And I know you're a guy that's very good at helping people reframe the conversation, regroup, reboot, out of the gate in 2022, what's the biggest number one piece of advice you can give somebody to kick off a better kick-ass year? Well, I just want everybody listening to do this exercise with me right now. Let's just get into it. Here's my question for you. What is your rich life? I want an answer to it. And I already know what 90% of people are going to say to me. This is what they're saying. I want to do what I want, when I want. Okay, that's a good start. Now, let me ask a couple more questions to unpeel your real answer. What do you want? Now, this is where people go silent. Their eyes just glaze over. Because most of us spend our lives living in our email inbox and worrying about what we're going to eat for dinner on Friday night. And we never ask ourselves these questions. What is my rich life? People will say answers like this. I want to travel. Great. Where do you want to go? Uh, some other country. No, 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 no. Here's the right answer. This is the kind of answer I want. I want to go to Bali. I want to fly on seat 3A. I want to take my parents, my children, my spouse, whoever. This is where we're going to eat. And this is what we're going to do to make an extraordinarily memorable experience. That's a rich life. And so it's no surprise that so many of us set these generic, boring New Year's resolutions. And then we abandon them by January 15th. Because 
what, what is it? I want to be healthy. Yeah, okay, I want to breathe oxygen. That's not really motivating. Give me something else. Give me something specific, and suddenly you will find that you are much more inspired to accomplish it. Is that the science behind this for me? Is that it's the specificity that's going to make your engine go? This is more the art of it. The art of it is setting dreams that are things you actually want. A rich life can be picking up your daughter from school every day at 3 p.m. That could be a rich life for you. A rich life could be buying a $1,500 coat. A rich life could be traveling two months a year. Money matters, of course. Money is a small but important part of a rich life. But if you ask people listening right now, what is your rich life? You'll often find that they haven't really thought about it. It's too intimidating. It's too scary. And deep down, they don't believe they can achieve it. So they say words like travel and I want to get healthier and, you know, I'd like to clean my garage out. All fine. You should probably clean your garage out. I've seen some of these garages. They're absolutely atrocious. Okay. <laughs> That's a, Don't look but, at mine, dude. Don't, don't look yeah, at mine. <laughs> yeah, no judging. However, you know, when it comes to money, so much of it is negative. People think about money. They've been warned of all the things that can go wrong. Oh, you better increase your savings rate. Oh, don't do this. And what I'm here to talk about is what you can do with your money, why money should be a source of joy and adventure and memorability. That is much more inspiring and much more likely to cause a real change in your life. As you're talking, I'm thinking about back when I was a financial planner, it's been a long time, but I'd start every meeting with that because I didn't know how to help them if I didn't know where they were going. And the frustrating thing I would have was trying to get that same stuff out of it. And I'm wondering why that is, why we do we not commit because we don't want to put ourselves on the hook because man, it was a wild day when somebody came in and the goals were actually specific for me. So what was the one that you remember when somebody said what they want to do? I remember a client of mine named Greg who told me, he goes, listen, I know everybody wants to travel. I'm a guy that spent my whole career traveling. I want my garden and here's what I want with my garden. And he told me exactly what he wanted. He said, I've been reading nonfiction my whole career to get my career together. I want to read six nonfiction books per year. And he had this whole thing, but he also committed because he was in a relationship and you and I'll talk about relationships later. He committed that he would take two vacations a year during his retirement, wherever his spouse wanted to go, because he knew that she hadn't traveled like he had. Yeah. And when he, but, dude, when he had that, I never saw that. I never yeah. saw that ever. He's a superstar. You know, he's clearly thought about it. And I speak to a lot of people who worry about money and they are obsessed with these $3 questions. Uh, should I buy the latte? Oh, should I get the appetizer? I'm like, I, I look at their numbers. I go, do you want to end up at 65 with $8 million in the bank obsessing over the price of iceberg lettuce? What kind of life is that? I think it's a tragedy to live a smaller life than you have to. Now, for everybody listening, especially the fire community, who's going to say, Ramit, oh, you s just spend too much money. Life isn't about spending. Please listen. Rich does not have to mean spending more. It does not have to only mean luxury. Rich can mean many things. Your money lens can determine what you value. So most people in America, their only money lens is cost. How much does it cost? It's like being in a symphony and only having one instrument. It's not really a great symphony. I want everybody to have multiple money lenses. Another money lens could be security. So where you live is safe or where you're going to dinner, there's uh, somebody to watch your car. It can be results. Yeah, sure, you can work out using YouTube videos or you can hire a personal trainer if you want better results. It can be pure delight. You know, I'm going to a restaurant, maybe it costs twice as much as the neighborhood restaurant, but it's truly delightful. They put a little smoke on the thing when it comes out and the fajitas are sizzling. That's cool. There are so many money lenses. And if you only restrict yourself to one, which is typically cost, it's no wonder that people don't inspire themselves with money because their entire worldview is how little can I pay? How much can I save? And listen, I love saving. I want you to invest aggressively. I talk about this but I want to know what's the purpose of it. What are you doing with your money? It's so frustrating being in, in some of these online forums and you've been in these before too. I saw a guy in one forum saying, you know, my kid's uh, Gatorade 
it's, it's just too expensive. So I'm going to learn how to make my own. And don't get me <laughs> wrong. No stink on that Rami. If, if your passion in life is making Gatorade, well, yeah. go for it, man. But I, I didn't get that picture. I got the picture that somebody is making this $3 decision that you're talking about. Yeah, and also nobody can compete with the taste of lemon lime Gatorade. Come on, it's too good. Come, Come on. on, that's the best Gatorade there is. Okay, uh, yes, I, I have to tell you a couple of examples that that I find very illuminating on our cultural perspective on money. I recently asked people, "What would you do if you made ten million dollars?" And do you know what over half of people responded with? They go, "I would invest it. I would buy multifamily real estate." I go, "You made ten million dollars. Hey, if you don't like the example, make it 20. This is what they do. They always go, is it post-tax, pre-tax? What's my tax rate? I go, it's a f***ing hypothetical, man. Come on. You can't even dream. Okay. So I put that aside. Yeah. I go, whatever the number is, it's a big number. You, you just got a lot of money. What are you going to do with it? And their first response is, I'm going to save it. I'm going to invest it. I go, man, Yes, put put a little bit aside, but you just made life-changing money in this scenario. My real question is not what kind of multifamily real estate you're going to buy. My question is what are you going to do with your money? And if you can't answer that in a hypothetical scenario, then I guarantee you have no answer to what you're going to do with your own portfolio. Those people, this is what they're going to do. They're going to save. They're going to have an enviable savings rate, 30%, 40%. They're going to recalculate their Monte Carlo simulation 35 times a month. They're going to post about it on Fat Fire and other fire forums. And they're going to judge everybody who has less than a 32% savings rate because, oh, my God, financial literacy is out of control in America. And then they're going to move to Florida, get some leathery skin, and die. That's the life. That's it. And I say, where did you eat? Who did you take with you? What Did you go skydiving once or did you buy a nice shirt? Something. Did you donate generously? You know, create a rule for yourself. I'm only tipping 30% or higher. What are you going to do with your money? And uh, the answers are very lackluster. Uh, I, I want to share one more example, Joe, yeah, because please. this one also drove me crazy. Bring it because you're not at all passionate about this. So bring it. I, I want to finally see some passion. So there's this guy uh, on a forum who is young. He's like 28 or 30 years old and he has a huge net worth. It was something like uh, $12 million. Okay. Some guy sold a company or whatever. And his question was, where should I live to minimize taxes? Okay. Now everybody just listen right now. First of all, I know that there are approximately three topics we can talk about where everyone's going to get mad. And also everyone doesn't know what they're talking about. Number one is taxes. Number two is tipping. Number three is the price of weddings. I've written about them all. Just Google Ramit Sethi and any of those words. So this guy's $12 million. Do you understand how much a 30-year-old is going to have if they have $12 million at that age? What, hundreds of millions of dollars. You physically cannot spend that kind of money. It's impossible, okay? And he's optimizing for where he can minimize his taxes. Now, if the guy wants to live in... Florida or Dallas, Texas. God bless. I love it. If you if that's your rich life, do it. I, I, I love it. But I know it's not. I know that this person who could live in any city in the world, that's not his rich life because the first question he's asking is, how do I minimize my taxes? Now, let's zoom out. I don't want to judge just this person for taxes, although I am. I want to talk about why do we think this way? And the answer is we only have one note that we all play. And that is how little can I pay? How little can I pay for shoes? How little can I pay for taxes? And the same thing is how much is my savings rate, which is just an equivalent of how little can I pay for other things? Now, save, yes, invest aggressively. But that's just a tiny part of a rich life. And at a certain point, you got it dialed in. You got your formula. You use chapter five of my book. It's all automated. You don't even need to look at it. I spend less than an hour a month on my finances. A rich life is turning the chapter, turning the page and saying, what am I going to do with this? What kind of experiences am I going to create? That's so much more interesting than your 18 or 20% savings rate. You and I have, have uh, had past conversations for me where we've discussed uh, how we try to surround ourselves with the right people and how we have the right coaches and the right messaging coming in during the day. And I know from your appearance on other shows and other places, just how fanatical you are about making sure you set yourself up for that win. 
But if I'm trying to surround myself with those right people, those right messages in 2022, and I don't know where to start besides Stacking Benjamins and Ramit Sadie, you know, and I'm going to talk about your podcast in a minute. So let's say that you and I are off limits. How do you get that messaging? What's the framework you use? The first step is to acknowledge that there's a problem. I spoke to a couple, a couple of days ago on my podcast and they were having relationship challenges and they just insulted each other a lot. Lots of subtle verbal digs and they thought it was normal. They thought it was funny. And I asked them, what would your friends say uh, if I asked them about you? And they said, oh, they would say we're funny. Now, listening to them, I was like, that's not funny. It's not funny to verbally eviscerate your wife or your husband. And so later in the episode, I asked them, do you have any couples that you admire? And they stopped short, just silent, speechless. And they both acknowledged no. And so that was a moment where they finally acknowledged Oh my gosh, we don't have any couples or any people around us that we truly admire. Step one of acknowledging there might be a problem is really important because if you don't acknowledge you have a problem, then there's no why. There's no inspiration or drive to find other people. Let me put it this way. For everybody listening, take a quick mental inventory of the sites and the people you follow on social media and email. Do they inspire you? I don't mean do they tell you how important it is to save money. You already know that. You're probably already really good at that. Do they inspire you with their rich life? And if the answer is no, then now it's time to start getting on a piece of paper and saying, okay, who do I follow? And if I had to describe them in one word, what would it be? Be scientific about it. It's not, you know, just say, oh, these these people are overly focused on X, or I kind of get it. I've moved past this. Now on another column, step two is what kind of people do I want to surround myself? Notice I'm not even at the point of recommending specific people to follow. That's way later. What do I want to follow? Well, and, these, might- and, and these, by the way, Ramit, not to cut you off, but I'm also thinking these are phenomenal values-based conversations for couples to have, right? I mean, if you're planning with anybody this year, holy crap, is this a phenomenal yeah. dinner with wine conversation? If it's Cheryl and I, that this is powerful stuff. Totally, totally. It's so much richer when you can bring in your loved ones to this conversation. And it's such a beautiful thing to be able to say, you know what? I realized that I think I need to make a change. And My wish, my dream would be that you come along with me and we do this as partners, but I really need your help. Oh my God, has your spouse or your partner ever heard you say that? Wow, that's so incredibly connective. So you start making a list of what you do want to surround yourself with. And I think this is where people feel ashamed. You know, for me, I want to surround myself with beautiful things. I like beauty and I like simplicity. So I'm looking at, you know, like a Japanese monastery. I want beautiful design, handmade pottery. Now, for a lot of people, that feels shameful to say. It feels kind of frivolous. I don't care. That's what I want. For you, it might be, I want to improve my fitness or I want to become more adventurous and spontaneous. Awesome. Now you've written these values down. And finally, and finally, and finally, step three is you can go out and seek some of those people out. That's how I would do it. That's awesome. And there's a reason, by the way, I meet with you here in mom's basement is because I dig shag carpeting. Like that is, that is it. I got this thing and we're making it happen three days a week. Speaking of that, if there is one thing people should think about to begin their year, Ramit finally has a podcast. What the hell took you so long to, to, to get in this space, man? Well, uh, all of my friends, including you, told me, dude, you got to have a podcast. And I'm just a little slow. Uh, all my <laughs> friends were like, uh, hey, you know, podcasts have been out for a long time. <laughs> and, you're, and, and you're joining us in the basement at least once a year, you know? You know, the truth is I didn't have the winning idea. I knew what I didn't want to do. And I started to talk to couples in part because my wife and I had such a challenging time bringing our finances together really hard, you know, and that, that surprised me because I'm uh, Mr. I will teach you be rich. I thought, Oh, this should be easy. No. First we had challenging conversations, signing a prenup. And then when we got married and we started to organize our day-to-day finances month to month, that was challenging in a different way. 
And I found that uh, we were differing in values. I found that we use different terms to describe money. I found that the amounts were vastly different that we were discussing. And although it was the hardest thing we've done in our relationship to this point, I was like, if we are having these problems, then a lot of other couples are. I want to talk more about that point, but as a way of introducing this, I want to listen to just the first minute of the trailer for the I Will Teach You To Be Rich podcast. Let's listen in. Do you think you're cheap? I don't think I'm as bad as Greg. That's the second time they noticed you deflected to Greg. Would your family say that you are cheap? Yes. What about friends? Yes. By the way, their net worth is about $2 million. And, and that's how it begins. $2 million net worth, clearly, Ramit, not living their rich life. So common, so common for so many of us, whether you have $2 million today or you are on track for having $2 million because of your investments, everybody is taught how to save, but nobody teaches you how to spend. And it becomes incredibly complicated when you have a partner. So you yourself are probably not especially sophisticated at money and money psychology. And then you have to bring in a partner who has totally different views often brought by their parents. So you're fighting demons in your relationship. And I just, I'll tell you this. I had never heard a couple from behind closed doors sharing real numbers about their spending and sharing their actual fights and challenges. That's what you get on the I Will Teach You Bridge Well, and I was going to ask you just a little bit about that production because, you know, having done this for a few days, I know that getting those raw conversations is difficult, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. how hard is it to find people and to make them feel comfortable to share this stuff? Getting people to share openly was the hardest part of the podcast. And we had to learn how to do it. At first, people did not want to share. And here's what I discovered. First of all, almost every couple has differing opinions on money. So you don't have to feel alone. If anything, it's so affirming to hear other couples and whether they are the same culture, whether they are LGBTQ, there's so many different couples and you realize, oh my gosh, we're not alone. That's one. Two is people will be surprisingly open if they believe you're trying to help. And when I when they get on the podcast, I'm not sitting here telling them, oh my God, you need to cut back on how much coffee you buy. That's not the podcast. The podcast is spending a lot of time finding the clues of why they behave that way with money. Yeah, you're not doing the Susie Orman or Dr. Phil. How's that working for you? It definitely no. comes across as a, as a real collaboration. You have these intense conversations every episode. It's called, shockingly, I Will Teach You To Be Rich with the Ramit Sadie. Yeah. And before we say goodbye to everybody, if you've got one last word to make 2022 great, what would that be? Joy. Experience joy, engineer joy, feel joy. Make this year your rich life. Mm -hmm. Ramit Sadie, happy 2022, brother. I will link to, I will teach you to be rich. We'll also link to Ramit's website on our show notes page and in the 201, our newsletter. Thanks a ton for Kicking it off here in the basement. I really appreciate it. Always a blast. Thanks for having me. Hey, this is John in Seattle. And when I'm not telling terrible dad jokes to anyone who will listen, I'm stacking Benjamins. And that's how you kick off 2022 right there. Do we have to come show up for the rest of the year or can we just play this one on repeat? I think we just dropped the mic. We're done. Thank you. That's our 2022 contribution. <laughs> we'll listen to this every other day for the next uh <laughs> 365 days and you'll be good. Put that on repeat and, and you're great. Uh, you've got a favorite thing of Ramit's of all time that you like, like a something you live by. Oh, live by is tough. But one of my favorite things, I heard this on a podcast, I think it was a Tim Ferriss show that he did some years ago, was actually about going out to dinner. And you know, you go out to dinner and they give you the rest of the, the, the menu and it's got 700 things on it. And then the server's like, let me tell you about the three special things today. One of the things he talked about was being tired of making decisions that late in the day, you know, and you're just, you can't make good business decisions and, and why bother with trying to make good decisions at all. So he just orders everything. So listen, I have, cha have changed that a little bit and said, 
okay, what we're going to do now is anytime there's a special, you know, anytime the, the, the server says, here's our, here's our two things that the chef's got today, she gets one and I get the other. That way we can have whatever the hot thing is, we can share it. That the chef's and, excited about. Yeah. And that's what's like what, what they wanted to do today. And we're not looking at like, well, there's 500 different things on the menu. I don't know. I like it all. I just. How often does that work? Is it good? It's perfect. Yeah. First of all, there's not times when you're like, eh. no, no. I mean, but I don't, I mean, I go into it also recognizing that food is like fuel. Like I want the experience and I recognize that the thing that I'm getting is fuel, not like I has to be this most scrumptious thing ever. And if it's not my favorite, it's not my favorite. That's But okay. you also have an adventurous attitude toward it, right? Because it's something that you're like, oh, maybe I'll like it. Maybe I won't. Like you go in with that. Yeah. Yeah. But honestly, we're to the point now where we should just, when we went out for my birthday a couple of weeks ago, you know, after this appetizer special, the salad special, <laughs> And then the other thing, they the sushi roll special. It was like, okay, we don't need to eat anymore. We're good. Like they're like, and here's your dinner. I'm like, oh god, just oh, put it in a box. Yes, you know, it's so. like the Mexican restaurant. You're like, I'll just have the chips, right? <laughs> just, just you're not supposed to have. The, you're supposed to have the salad. Oh, you can get by with fajitas, but don't eat the shell unless they're corn. I'm trying to, you know, Doug was talking about like getting healthy. I know. To, I know. To pass I know. along the message. Uh, huge thanks to Ramit for helping us kick off 2022. Hey, let's uh, throw out the Haven Lifeline OG and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. Definitely the cilantro salsa at uh, <laughs> Chewy's. Mm-hmm. Let's go. Let's let's finish this thing up and go. Uh, it's spending time with your loved ones. It's your loved ones and your time. And that's why they made buying quality term life insurance actually simple Head to stackybedjamins.com slash Haven Life now to get a free quote. What a great way to start 2022, by the way, get that life insurance taken care of. You know, you know, if you're have your headphones on right now that I'm talking to you, not the person next to you. I'm talking to you. Get your life insurance in order. Their application is simple. It's online. You get an instant coverage decision. Price is affordable, of course, issued by their parent company, Mass Mutual, more than 160 years old. Today, we're going to throw out the Haven Lifeline to our new friend, Matt. Say hi, Matt. Hello, Joe, OG, and team. Thank you for having me on the podcast. Uh, love your show and all your emails and materials that you send out. Uh, yesterday, my wife and I were talking about our finances, and we decided that for the first time, we need to find a financial advisor. We are in our mid-30s, have three young children have no debt other than our mortgage, have a healthy cash flow from traditional W-2 jobs, a growing savings account with, you know, a fair amount of bones, automated 529s in place for our kids, a start on retirement plans, a handful of individual stocks. But what do we do next? How do we create our lifelong financial plan? What do we do when we receive excess income? How do we define, make progress toward, and achieve our financial goals? These questions are on our minds, but my real question for you is, how do you recommend we find an appropriate financial advisor? Ideally, we'd like someone we can meet with in person, but I realize that limits our options. Thank you in advance and happy holidays to you, your loved ones, your families and friends, and Doug. Thanks, Matt in New York. And and Doug. And Doug. And even Doug. Uh, thanks for that question, Matt, man, there's a few things going on there, but because I think those are, those are different things. I want to tackle his explicit question. Second OG, because the one that really interests me is when you have this excess income and you have this money that comes in, how do you allocate it to make sure it goes into the right investments in the right place? Cause before we get to financial planner, I think we should talk about financial plan. Yeah, I mean, so the way that I would think about this is um, the the priority of things that are most important to you. You mentioned a couple of things. You mentioned uh, 529s for kids. You mentioned uh, debt on a house. You mentioned, uh, you know, retirement and, or financial independence. So uh, cash in the bank. So you have to rank those things that are the most important to you to work on because quite often you can't do all of the things all at the same time. You know, you have to kind of get the financial independence stuff going and on track before you can add to 
you know, the 529 plans for the kids or something. So um, that would be the first order of business. The second thing to do is to think about like in an ideal circumstance, what does this look like for you? Are you trying to, you said you're in your mid thirties. Are you trying to be financially independent when you're 40? Well, if so, unless you have a gigantic income, you're not gonna be able to do that and send the kids to school and pay off the house and, and, you know, go to Disney every six months. You know what I mean? Like you have to kind of figure out where you are in that. The reality is, is that when you're in your thirties, you've only been working for 10 or 15 years. And frankly, you know, retirement seems like a forever thing out into the, out into the future. I was just talking to a friend of mine, uh, who is refinancing their house and, and, uh, we were talking about the merits of the 30 or the 15 year mortgage. And I said, I like the 15 because I want to, it kind of times out nicely with kind of the traditional retirement thing. And she said, Oh my God, are we supposed to retire in 15 years? <laughs> Cause she's 45. And it's like, Holy crap. That's like right around the corner <laughs> you know, in, 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 in all, you know, all things being considered. So, um, so I think prioritizing it and then kind of envisioning with you and your spouse, like what, what does it look like? Are you trying to do this early retirement? Are you trying to make sure the kids can be doctors? Are you trying to like, what's the, what's the most important thing after you have that down, then you can start thinking about with those priorities, when you have extra money, make a decision today for how those uh, extra funds are going to be spent. You know, let's say you've got four things on your list. You've got, I want to have some fun. I want to retire early. I want to send my kids to school and I want to pay off my house. And you're doing your thing. You're putting money in your 401k and the 529s and so on and so forth. And now you get a bonus. Well, every time you have to make a decision about that bonus, it's frustrating because if you haven't made the decision in in advance, you feel guilty about whatever you decide. If you say, well, but this bonus, we really want to go to Disney with. Then you go to Disney and you think, I should be saving this. I should be investing it. I should putting it in my 529. Like there's probably a better place. So choose in advance what you want to do with those things. Maybe you say the order of events for us is I want to put 50% of all my extra money in early retirement money. I want to put 10% for the kids. I want to put 10% for paying off the house. And I want the other 30% for fun. And then boom. Now, if your bonus check is 20 grand, you know how to, how to allocate it. If your bonus check is two, you know how to allocate it. If it's 200, you know how to allocate it. And you don't have to make any value judgments in the moment of what's, what, you know, what's most important today, because it'll change throughout the you know, throughout the day. Um, as it relates to finding an advisor, there's a bajillion places to look. Well, and actually, uh, before we get into advisor, I want to jump on on what you just said, because I think that this is the fun stuff. And this is the stuff, OG, that you can't delegate to the advisor, which is why I would get these priorities that you're talking about in order first. I would try to have it. And don't get me wrong. An advisor can help you focus those discussions and narrow it down, but before it should you, help you make uh, ask ask questions is what should happen. Yeah, right? yeah. But I think if you look at yourself as the CEO of your family, and you're having these great discussions with anybody who's in the family that's going to be involved in this process, you're having these great discussions about what's important to us first. That's going to help you drive everything. It's going to narrow the focus and narrow your financial planner's time down to the things that are most important to you. So you end up getting better value for your money. And I think a better relationship with the advisor because you're in charge. I feel like failed financial planner relationships. So as you're going into this, failed financial planning relationships are when you don't delegate, you abdicate, meaning you're not delegating some of the responsibility for whatever pieces of the plan to them because they have systems and processes to do it. They can do it faster. You're abdicating the throne going, Hey, uh, manage my money, money person. And, uh, I'm going to check back in in six months. That never works. Yeah. That doesn't work at all. But if you have these things that you value and, and you know what you're looking for from a goal perspective, man, then it can be a powerful thing because now you're delegating stuff to them instead of just going, hey, not sure what I really expect and I'm not going to pay attention to this at all. Well, and that's the biggest thing. You can delegate the conversation. You can delegate the day-to-day you know, task management, but you can't delegate your goals. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. It's, not, it's not up to me to decide for you if you want to retire at 45 or 55. You know, I can ask you really good questions along the way to help you figure that out. I'm not going to pick for you. Hey, you know, it's going to be 47 and a half. 
we can do the math and all that sort of stuff. That's that's kind of what advisors do. So honestly, you probably need to, like you said, start with all of this stuff in advance. And then as you start interviewing people locally or virtually or however you're going to do it, then that makes that conversation more useful to you, it makes a more conversation more useful to you know your potential planner because the first thing that I'm going to ask you is, well, tell me, what, what are you trying to do? And if you go, I don't know. I go, okay. So what do you want to talk about then? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, I don't know. Uh, how am I doing? Well, sounds like you're doing good. You got lots of money saved and kids are healthy and your marriage is okay. So I guess you're doing good. Yeah. Like, what, what do you need help with? I don't know. All right, well, figure that out and come back and talk to me later. You know, that's kind of the thing. Yeah, Matt, there are a ton of places to look. One of my favorite places to start. Once again, if you start with that, with what you're looking for, then it narrows your search because then you know advisors that don't fit. So that's the first thing. Second thing is I think you're looking for a relationship where you, you frankly hit it off with the person. You, it isn't a sales pitch. It doesn't feel like you're going into an office with a salesperson. It feels like you're going in with somebody who's a member of your team. I look at a good financial planner, a good financial advisor, like it's your agent, like you're a, you're a, a rock star and this person is helping you create this great stuff that you want to do. Somebody that's got your back. And uh, if you hit it off with somebody that way, I think that that is very important. We hear about fees a lot in the industry. I think that you ask those questions, frankly, after the fit, not not before. I think you look and see if it's a fit and then you see how the person gets paid. I feel like way too many publications focus on, well, ask them how they get paid first. Who cares how they get paid if you have no idea what they do for you? And the way the ways to find those people, I mean, to your point, OG, there's uh, you can look for CFPs. There's a list of CFPs yeah, on the CFP, CFP board. CFP.net is a great place. If you're just getting started, XY Planning Network is a great kind of fee uh, uh, based uh, organization that has uh, a ton of advisors now on their platform. Probably, I don't know, I think it's close to 3,000 now, yeah. something like that, or 1,500 maybe. Uh, but what's nice about that is that you can drill down to area or specialty. You know, if you happen to have a unique circumstance, you know, in your, in your family or something, you know, you can look for that. Or if you really want them, I mean, Matt says he wants somebody local. So you can drill down that way too. Absolutely. Ask people who are successful, who they use. Think of the people that you're trying to surround yourself with who are on the same path that you are, but just a little bit further ahead. Ask them, you know, what are they doing to, to kind of help things? And you'll probably get some good recommendations there as well. Thanks for the question, Matt. If you've got a question for us, head to uh, stackingbenjamins.com slash voicemail. And for being brave and leaving that voicemail, we will send Matt and we're going to send you a code with a uh, Stacking Benjamins Haven Life Greatest Money Show on Earth Circus t-shirt. We got lots of shirts at stackingbenjamins.com slash shirts. But that is, uh, that's my, that's my favorite. I don't know. The new book tour t-shirt is pretty fun, but you got to come to the Got to come to the book tour to get that one. You can't get that one online. Our heavy metal (laughs) t-shirt with all the the dates on the back is pretty hilarious. Speaking of good stuff, if you are somebody who who wants to dive into any of these topics or topics we talk about on the show more, we have a fantastic newsletter called the 201. We call it the 201 for a reason. We take all of these topics and Brooke Miller, who also is somebody who's been a CFP and knows these topics uh, deeply like OG and I do, dives even deeper into all of these. So it's not so much a guide to the show as even if you miss an episode, uh, you can sit down and dive into these same topics in even more detail than we can do on the show. Plus, we give you other episodes, other resources on all the things we talk about stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. It's the number 201 that gets you there to sign up. Thanks to everybody who's left us reviews of the show. There are so many people that we need to thank, but but just thanks to all of you for, for hanging, out, hanging out with us. Your time is valuable and uh, we don't take that for granted that you spend time with us. If there's somebody else who should be hanging out with us, pass this along to them. Let's help each other get financial literacy. Bring your sister, your brother with you. Makes it a good time. Last but not least, if you're looking for better financial planning, help in your corner, you want to make better decisions. OG and his team are taking clients 
It is a new year, new year, new you. Head to stackybenjamins.com slash OG. And that's the link to his team's calendar and how they can help you think bigger about your goals in 2022. All right. That's going to do it for today. Doug, man, you got it from here, my friend. What should we have learned today? Sure thing, Joe. I'll tell everybody what they should have learned. First, take some advice from Ramit. This can be your year. Just make sure it is. And you know how to do that? Take action starting right now. Second, where you live makes a huge difference in how much you'll need to retire but it can also make a difference in your happiness, connection, and opportunities. While we love Jackson, Tennessee, don't forget your own happiness in the money and retirement equation. But the big lesson? The number in your retirement account deserves as much attention as the number on the scale. It's fine to weigh 800 on the scale, as long as it's the credit monitoring scale. Hey, stackers, from our family to yours, Thank you so much for listening and for starting the year off right with us. Happy New Year to our whole Stacking Benjamins family. Thanks so much to Ramit Sadie for being here with us today. You can learn more about him at IWillTeachYouToBeRich.com. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, and is created by Joe Salciha. Our producer is Karen Rapine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch with help from Joe and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. Know how I know how brilliant Paulette is? She wrote the words I'm reading right now. While she's not putting awesome words in my mouth, she helps writers power their work and businesses power their words. See how she can help you at thatwriterpaulette.com. After you listen to our show, check out our show notes page and the 201 Deep Dives, written by our website manager and blog editor, Brooke Miller. You'll find all things money at the 201, our newsletter, at stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Once we get all of this goodness bottled up, it goes over to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart, who helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to talk about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and room mother in our Facebook group, The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. Here's a weird fact. She and Tina Eichenberg are never in the same room at the same time. To join all The Basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, reminding you... Don't put off tomorrow anything. You can put off until the day after tomorrow. That's way better than tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. We had two events happen in Texarkana last week, which, uh, which are so Texarkana that I thought we should uh, cover these in detail. Oh, gee. By the way, people around here know the best redneck jokes. They know the best ones. And we did have a couple instances. But before we get to those, well, instance number one happened at our book launch party. But the book launch party, thanks for coming, by the way. That, that was super fun. Thanks to our friend Jason Fawbush for being our MC that night and for lots of friends coming out. We had, we had some stackers even come to Texarkana, our friend, Chris, who we got to meet for the first time, uh, drove up from Shreveport. That was nice. Ian came in from uh, Northwest Arkansas and uh, hung out with us. Uh, Stephanie, who uh, also volunteered to help us sell books so I could spend time mingling and, and signing. She sold books and shirts and hung out there. She was there. So 
It was fantastic. A, a, a nice, fun night, OG. And uh, you was made had it by all. I agree. You made you made it brighter by being there. Ah. And thanks to Dave uh, at uh, Hopkins Hopkins Ice House, which is a fine place for an event like that. He made a special drink for us that looked like a black and tan, didn't it? Uh, yeah, not my favorite. So I didn't uh, really pay too much attention to it, but yes. But it was really cool. He had a special drink called the Stack, which was really neat that that he not only let us have our event there, but also uh, took part, hung out with us. And um, so happy that uh, he also had the special drink. Did you see the cake? I did. Actually, I didn't see it until Autumn told me about it, but I... But I happened to get a good picture of it right before it got. I didn't. I didn't get a picture of it prior to it getting cut up. But you could tell. So uh, I start cutting it, and I notice the cake doesn't say "stacked." Your super serious guide to modern money management. It says "state." Staked. S T A K E D. That's fantastic. <laughs> State. Yeah. Uh, spelling is not critical in this part of the country. In the cake designer world. Second. Sound it out, people. Sound it out. And by the way, everybody there, everybody there said, because like I said, we all know the best jokes about this area and we love living here. So it's this self-deprecation that I love. But everybody's like, yep, that's Texarkana right there. Oh, you want to spell stacked? S-T-A-K-E-D. Stacked it up. And then the second thing that happened last week, and we need to cover this before we go. I don't know if you saw the weather that hit here last week in Texarkana, but we had weather that was reported around the nation. I have this from The Independent. This is written by Oliver O'Connell, worldwide publication. When two storms approached the city of Texarkana on the Texas border with Arkansas last Wednesday afternoon, many people carried on with their day. High school soccer team practice was dismissed as rain began to fall and became heavier. At a wheel and tire store nearby, employees thought they heard hail hitting the roof. However, after the weather system passed, residents soon found this was no normal rainstorm. Fish littered the ground over a swath of the town. You didn't see this? I did not. Tom Brigham, manager of Discount Wheel and Tire, told the Texarkana Gazette, that he saw a fish falling from the sky during the thunderstorm on Wednesday. It was hailing and looked like there was about to be a tornado and there was fish falling as many as 25 to 30 fish, some six to seven inches long littered the ground outside the business and more were on the property next door. A smell of fish hung in the air described as like that on a fishing dock or at a fish market. And an employee was dispatched to pick them up in case somebody slipped on them. Fish. Fish falling from the sky in Texarkana. It turns out that uh, that as part of the weather system, you can get these water spouts from nearby lakes. Almost like think of a tornado going over a lake and just suck stuff up. And in this case, it sucked fish out of the lake and then dropped the fish all over town. Can't happen anywhere else. In fact, when I first saw it, I first saw online one of those Facebook groups and somebody goes, yeah, did you see the fish falling from the sky? And people started posting, yeah, this one fell in my yard, like a catfish that's like four feet long. <laughs> somebody posted like a shark. Somebody else said, yeah, I was outside Texas High and uh, this fell. And there's like the Gilligan's Island boat, you know, that they have they put in front of the school uh, on a, um, uh, what do you call that? Uh, they the mascot cut and pasted. Oh, this sounds like a giant fish story. It totally sounds like a giant fish story and a hundred percent true. hundred percent true. Only in Texarkana can you hundred percent may be true. Spell stacked S T A K E D and fish will fall from the sky. Allegedly. It's why we live here. It's, it's, it's why I live here. Very creative spelling. And, uh, and w- w- when you want fish, you just weather phenomena, go outside during a rainstorm 